until the release of the movie, and this will be the first time I have to do a part two of, of a video. I just couldn't fit everything into the other one. You know, uh, the first reviews for Prince Caspian have come out, and I just couldn't. You know, there's so much to talk about. So I'm doing a part two. And uh, once again, briefly, brief, you know, little disclaimer. Um, this may or may not be true. Most of it's off IMDb, for heaven's sake, the incorrect movie database, you know. And anyone could have written this, so there's no knowing how much of this is true. Uh, but for sake of discussion, let's assume it is true, even though I doubt all of it is. Without a doubt, uh, the, the issue that has caused the most discussion and uh, the surprise the most people and some of the most controversy that people are freaking out over the most is Peter passing on his sword to Caspian. I'm just kidding. Obviously, uh, it's Susan and Caspian supposedly have a little a little kiss. Uh, we have no idea how how long it is or if they like make out or whatever. Um, but apparently they kiss. Uh, a couple of reviewers agree on this. Uh, the one, the first quote I read is, "They flirt. He rescues her. They kiss at the end." Now, to be f perfectly honest, the thing that worries me most about that statement is the fact that he he rescues her. It's like this is movie is sounding more and more su like a superhero movie as it goes, like having the guy like rescue the girl the last minute or whatever. It's like, give me a break. Um, the kiss, honestly, I'm not initially. My first thought was they got to be jo joking or whatever. Then you know. Then when it looked like it was, it was like, no, of course. But now the more that I think about it, it's, it's probably, now my thought was probably just a harmless peck on the cheek. It's like, you know, maybe five frames of, of, of the coronation. And uh, it's, I don't, I don't even think it's going to be a, a romantic kiss. If it is, believe me, I'll be the first one to leave the night raid on Andrew Adamson's house to have him lynched. But, um, I think it more likely it's just a, sh a chivalrous little peck. It's not even, um... You know, I mean, like, I've seen people do that, not so much in this culture, but in other, in other cultures, it's not totally uncommon. It's just a thing of a, a, a respectful, you know, chivalrous kiss goodbye. You know, it's not, I don't think it's anything, it doesn't have to be anything romantic about it necessarily. So uh, I'm not freaking out over it. I mean, I definitely think the coronation could do without it. I, did complete, I think it's totally unnecessary. The context is everything I understand. But uh, it's more the fact that he rescues her and they flirt, honestly. That's the thing that's really um, uh, freaking me out. So, um... But, uh, so the kiss, yeah, I could probably do without it. If it's romantic at all, yeah, I could definitely do without it. But, uh, I'm not freaking out over it nearly as much as some other people then. I think it'll probably, pr it'll probably, um, won't even, probably hardly even notice it, would be my guess. But obviously, if it's romantic, I'll be totally pissed off about that. And, uh, one minor note here, the fact that Lucy just stays back at Aslan Tower and doesn't fight at the Night Raid, which we see, in, we see Susan in the trailer being all, you know, being all superhero. So the opposite of Susan's character, like as I've said a bazillion times, like I would much rather have you know Susan stay behind, do I don't know what, and have Lucy um, uh, fight at the Night Raid, or, or have some role in the Night Raid. That I think that would be much more, it would fit her character much more than Susan. So I think the only thing more annoying than Susan fighting is that Susan fighting and Lucy not. Or we know Lucy fights at some point, but apparently not at the Night Raid. So that's really really annoying. Uh, who kills Miraz is a question that's uh, come up. Obviously, we've seen some footage in the, uh, in the trailer. We've also seen a picture. But we've seen footage in the trailer where it appears the Caspian has the opportunity to kill Miraz. And um, the reviewers seem to agree that, and obviously big spoilers ahead here, um, the re reviewers seem to agree that uh, it is at least someone close to Miraz or one of his lords that kills him. It's a betrayal. Uh, don't know if it's gonna be. don't know if it's going to be Glazelle or Sepespian. Uh, in the movie, but um, there's someone close to him apparently. But these people probably don't know the book well enough. That's what it sounds like to get, know which one. But it's someone close to him. It's a betrayal. It's not casting or anything. So whew, I sure hope that's true. And a reviewer was asked, uh, "Is there a duel of sorts between Edmund and Trumpkin, which there is in the book? In the book, they fight um, in order to basically Edmund to prove himself that he really is King Edmund, the J King Edmund the Just from the ancient past. It's not a real fight, of course, like we're afraid of with P Peter and Caspian in the movie." But uh, the reviewer answered yes right after they meet. Now, does he really mean right after they meet? Like um, maybe, um, you know, they pull Trumpkin to shore, and for whatever reason, Trumpkin is startled. And you ah! you know, and starts fighting, and um, in that process, you know, Edmund kind of proves himself or whatever. Or maybe there's a time cut. Maybe you know, Trumpkin says, who are you? And they say, we're Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. And Trumpkin says, yeah, right, in the book, Trumpkin's always a skeptic. And... Um, so then there's a t then, 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 then you know they say something to the effect of well we'll show you or whatever and then there's a time cut where it shows them you know uh, f fencing and then Edmund or Trumpkin believes uh, so or maybe it doesn't really mean right after they maybe he means like five minutes after they meet and so which uh, 
which is, you know. So I'm just not sure what he means by right after they meet, but at least it looks like that Edmund and Trump can do duel, which I think is one of the most exciting sword fights in the series, just because of the way Lewis describes it is uh, so uh, exciting about this was real sword fighting. And then they have that whole line about he was King Edmund the Just once again, you know, return, return, being one of the themes of Prince Caspian, the return to Narnia being the, is the subtitle of the book. And uh, so at least that scene's in there, and I, I hope it lives up to Lewis's description. It's just as exciting. Um, Peter passing on his sword. Apparently, I uh, I'd heard uh, you know William Mosley when we interviewed him on set said that you know he pa Peter passes on his sword, but I think most people, including myself, took that figuratively. Um, that meant that he was going to pass on the kingship. Obviously, there's this stupid antagonism between the characters in the movie, and that was going to be kind of a, you know, a symbol of him passing on the kingship and you know finally be learning humility and all that. And I admit that uh, passing on Rindon uh, does it makes me uncomfortable because it's, it's not in the book. And F Father Christmas gave those gifts to Peter, and um, so uh, that definitely makes me uncomfortable. Uh, I admit it's not a big change. I'll probably ha hardly even notice it. But uh, it it does seem this makes me kind of uncomfortable a little bit. Although it's interesting to note that um, the Rindon may very well have been on board the Dawn Treader because remember Lucy wants her cordial, and uh, Caspian says, "Well, we I brought it. It's one of the uh, royal treasures. You left it behind, so they brought her cordial. So it's very uh, possible that uh, Rindon was on board the Dawn Treader. Uh, but although Caspian never actually uses it, so I admit that's it does make me kind of uncomfortable, and I don't like it. But uh, it's not the biggest change. It's probably you know not something worth fussing over. A few tidbits about Reapy Chief, not much, but certainly worth mentioning. Uh, one person said that they were disappointed with his voice. That might have just been a temp voice. The movie's not done yet, obviously. You know, in many cases, uh, the um, they have to animators have to start animating uh, before a voice is cast. That was certainly the case with Aslan, and uh, so it's possible that it wasn't Eddie Izzard's vo Eddie Izzard's voice. But uh, and as far as the CGI, it was totally not done. You know, it was just this blocky little mouse. You know, so they couldn't really tell us anything about that. Um. But uh, then one person said that Reaper Chief was hardly memorable. Another person, you know, seemed to like him more. And so, you know, we'll see. He's totally unfinished anyway. And so we'll have to see. Uh, interesting interview with uh, Eddie Izzard. I guess this is kind of his first, uh, not really an interview, just, you know, a little paragraph. His first words, you know, talking about the, the, being cast as Reaper Chief. And he describes Reaper Chief as uh, insane. And uh, as an insane mouse, which I definitely think is just, it's not saying Reaper Chief is going to be insane in the movie. And that wouldn't be his decision anyway. That would be something for you know, the writers or Adamson to work out. It's just his approach as an actor. I mean, think about it. If you're an actor trying to portray Reapy Cheap, how can you just play that straight-faced and like a normal, you know, you're, you're Eddie is or a human being trying to play Reapy Cheap. You got the, you know, put me at the front and stuff like that. I mean, you can't play that straight-faced. You've got to get a little bit into it and crazy, you know? And um, so as an approach for an actor, I think that that's how you play it. I mean, I, I try to, I mean, you can't just say, all I ask is that you please put my, me and my people at the front. You know, you've got to get into, into it. He's kind of, Reaper Chief's kind of an out there character. Like, I think of insane Reaper Chief, and I think of, hurrah, let them come. All I ask is that you put me and my people at the front. You know, it's something kind of like that. And I think coming from, you know, a CG character's voice, I think that's going to play very well. That's just his approach as an actor. And uh, I think that's uh, the, the right approach as an actor. That doesn't mean he's going to be insane in the movie. But Reaper Chief's kind of an out there character. You know, you have to do that a little bit. And uh, I support Eddie Izzard 100%, especially after uh, hearing uh, another, uh, some more audio clips from him recently uh, from the BAFTA Awards. I think I'm absolutely, I think he. It, it's one of the some of the best news we've had about the the film. Certainly, with casting, is Reapy Cheap, and so so I support Eddie Izzard one hundred percent. Think he's going to totally nail Reapy Cheap. Just the right mixture of you know I can see him doing Reapy Cheap's uh, chivalrous side, you know, uh, but my honor is my own. I can see him doing the put my put me at the front side, you know, and and also his voice is credibly high enough to be a mouse, although not annoyingly high. So I think it's just he just has the absolute perfect voice for Reaper Chief. And this idea of him, his approach as an actor being Reaper Chief's kind of insane, this seems like just the right approach, you know, uh, for an actor. Even though that's, I'm not saying that's what he's going to be in the kind of how he's going to come across in the movie. So uh, 90 days to go, uh, first reviews. Uh, a lot of it may or, not, may or may not be true, but it's certainly fun to discuss these issues. And obviously, as we get closer and closer to the release, uh, more and more uh, issues, big and small, are going to come up. Ha! Reapy Cheap? Insane? Yeah!